Welcome to the 72nd episode of the New Ventures podcast. I am your host Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate finance firm and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. Along with my co-host Professor Jaydeep Prabhu, we try and understand the links between climate change and food security in these series of conversations. Hello everyone, I am Jaydeep Prabhu. I am a professor of marketing at the Judge Business School, University of Cambridge. My area of interest is frugal innovation, how to do more and better with less. I am particularly interested in how frugal innovation can be applied in the food sector to enable us to deal with issues of climate change and ensure food security. I am delighted to be joining Sanjay on this podcast with our guest today. We have two guests today. Dr. Merl Solomon is a professor and former head of the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Professor Solomon did her PhD in the field of integrated coast management and has since then dedicated her whole life in working with the communities who stay along the coast. Menka Vansant is a doctoral candidate at the University of Cape Town studying the impacts of infrastructure development on the lives of small scale fishers. Welcome Dr. Solomon and Vansant. Yes, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Merle, I wonder if I could start with you to ask you what sparked this lifelong interest in fisheries and coast management. Well, I always loved the outdoors and the ocean. And at university, I became increasingly fascinated in the interactions and relationships between people and the sea. But I was also concerned about the degradation of the coastal environment through inappropriate development. And hence, I focused my doctoral research on developing procedures for improving assessment of development applications in the coastal zone. But my interest in small-scale fisheries and fishing communities really began when I was approached by a small-scale fishing community living about 350 kilometers north of Cape Town who were struggling with decline in catches, and they approached me for some scientific uh, support. And uh, they were very concerned about the presence of diamond boats in the vicinity of their estuary. And it was through working with them that my journey into the world of small-scale fisheries really began. How interesting. And Menka, what prompted you to do your PhD with Merle? So I actually lived in Alaska with commercial salmon fishers for a summer in between my bachelor's and master's degrees. And during that experience, I learned about the contentious pebble mine, which had the potential to wipe out the largest wild salmon habitat in the world. So many people in Alaska depend on salmon for food and nutritional security, as well as their economic livelihood. And that was what really prompted my interest in fishery mining conflicts. So I, when I wanted to go on to do my PhD, I was kind of looking for advisors who, who fill that knowledge gap. I was really excited when I came across Merle. I thought that was exactly the kind of research I want to do. And now here I am. And Menka, tell us a little bit about the research that you've been actually doing. Yeah, of course. So my dissertation research is a case study on Port Nolith. It's a very small diamond mining and fishing town up in the Northern Cape. It's actually quite close to the Namibian border. And my research in a nutshell exemplifies the historic and contemporary harm of mining and how this community has really been burdened with the environmental, social, and economic costs of the extractives industry. So first it began with colonialism and the apartheid regime, and now it's really globalized capitalism that has taken and is taking so many of their resources, but it's very unclear what is being given back in return. My research analyzes how these historic harms have influenced the community's perceptions of more recent developments, such as offshore oil and gas, uh, that the government and the private sector are both pushing, and how these perceptions compare and contrast with the key stakeholders that are driving this ocean economic agenda. So I specifically work with small-scale fishers and diamond divers, but Port Nolith is a quite small community, and the relatives of fishers and divers have also participated in my research. And one thing that really stuck out to me is one research participant told me that Port Nolith is a place that the world forgot. And I think that sums up my research quite well. 
It's a ghost town that sits upon one of the most biodiverse areas in the world with an incredible amount of natural resources. But looking at the town, you would never guess that. It's, it's truly a ghost town there. There's, there's really not much going on there and the people are hurting. And since you use the word ghost town, Merle, Menka has actually sent me quite a few of your papers as a preparation of this podcast. One of the things I really understood was that small scale fishers play a very pivotal role, but that role never shows up in the country's GDP figures. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, increasingly, though, the recognition of the value of the small-scale fishery sector to things like food security, employment, livelihoods, poverty eradication, and even recognizing the value of fisheries as an integral part of people's culture and their way of life is coming to the fore. But, you know, not so much in South Africa. The problem is these values are really difficult to monetize. So they're not captured in the GDP of most countries. I mean, certainly not in South Africa. I mean, how do you value being able to send your children to school in GDP terms or just the dignity of association of having a good job? So although I think there is increasing attention to the sector in enhancing our understanding of its importance, we still don't have the tools to ensure that these values are captured in GDP terms. That's such an important point. And, you know, the importance of community as well and communities. So Menka, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about this community. I imagine they have a long tradition. And yet, of course, as you pointed out, they are often poor and marginalized and unheard. Their voices are not heard. Can you tell us a little bit more about their lives? Of course. So small scale fishers are a historically marginalized group in South Africa. And they were only allowed to fish for themselves um, instead of a commercial fishing boat once apartheid ended. But their connection to the ocean is, is quite special and profound. The role of small-scale fishers is really important in terms of food and nutritional security and economic livelihoods. But it's also important in the way that they see and appreciate the ocean in a very different manner. And understanding that the sea is this living or uh, kinetic being and having that cultural and spiritual connection to it it's a place where they believe that their ancestors lie and unfortunately this tradition is not really reflected in processes such as marine spatial planning and ocean economic development these plans are spearheaded by the south african government and it's it's quite sad i mean the the historical marginalization these kind of historic colonialities have really manifested in the present. So, for example, their their boat permits and total level effort to keep getting cut remains very unclear as to how they're going to be able to feed themselves. And it's quite scary. There are not many youth who are actually taking an, an interest in this cultural heritage of fishing. And it's quite scary to see that this culture and way of life could potentially be dying out. All the fishers you work with are older and their health and livelihoods are really being diminished, especially when, you know, they have to be prioritized. The sea is their, is their livelihood, it is their culture, and they really need support to be able to live out um, what they have always done uh, intergenerationally. And what is the role of the women in these communities? Yeah, so especially women in this sector, they they have an, an important role as what we call fleckers in South Africa. And unfortunately, there are no legal frameworks to protect them and enhance gender equality. They have also been systematically excluded and their work throughout the fisheries value chain, but specifically as a flecker in the post-harvest sector has been severely underestimated. Another issue that really needs to be discussed and that has cropped up in uh, in my own dissertation research, is that when we speak of these extractive developments that are also taking place um, in and around, you know, these coasts and the offshore, there's also gender-based violence that incurs in these communities whenever um, there is a mining activity going on. Um, so one book that I actually highly recommend uh, to the audience is read the book Letting Them Die. It's by Catherine Campbell. And I actually found it quite profound just looking at my own research. It was not something that I was 
quite expecting coming across the impact of women and especially the public health aspect as well of the impact on mining communities. So uh, this book particularly talks about the HIV AIDS crisis on women in South Africa in a mining town. So yeah, it's a, it's a topic that has come up in my research, uh, the public health impacts of the diamond mining industry and how women are often left with very few choices in terms of employment. So one thing that has come up in my in my work is that you know women often prostitute themselves to a minor. She could up, end up getting an STD, HIV, tuberculosis, or becoming pregnant. And these are issues that are often overlooked in the social impact assessments in the mining industry. So yeah, it's really twofold. It's it's one uh, the women who do partake in the fishery sector need to have this legal framework and, and protection and really enhance gender equality within the sector. And then the second aspect is also looking at the impact of mining within women in, in terms of public health and employment. I understand that, Menka. One thing that struck me is when you said that the youth are not involved in fishing anymore. So I'm going to ask actually, Merle, because, you know, again, the papers that you sent me seem to indicate that, you know, small scale fishers do survive even after decades of marginalization, discrimination, and very direct support of the government to the industrialized fishing sector. Does it surprise you that these communities do survive at all? Yeah, well, I mean, I think their resilience is remarkable in the face of colonialization, global capitalism, and the privatization of the oceans now, very much with the sort of rise of the blue economy, and their exclusion from decision-making process. In fact, their exclusion from the sector, from the fishing sector for many, many years, although you know, there has always been fishing, informal fishing, and many parts of our coastline in South Africa, you know, were not being monitored, patrolled. And so fishing has always taken place in many of these more sort of traditional areas. You know, so people have continued fishing, um, despite all of these pressures. So what makes them more resilient? You know, honestly, I I don't have an easy answer, but I think it's their connection, it's their strong cultural connection to the ocean, their innovation, their, their knowledge of the environment, I think. And of course, their absolute dependence on these resources for survival, I think, enables them to find ways of continuing with their fishing practices. Menka, tell us a bit more about how these various forces are threatening the survival of these communities, industrialization, mining, globalization. And maybe you could tell us of your experience of other sites as well, if you've studied them. Sure. So yeah, I'll start off with Port Nalath, because that's what I know best. And it's actually why I chose this town to really do my case study and do a deep dive into it because of all the factors that you just mentioned, uh, both historic and contemporary. So there is a massive influx of mega infrastructure developments coming into an area that has already been historically harmed by mining. And it is very unclear how exactly these development activities are going to benefit the local communities. So Port Nalith and the surrounding areas in the Northern Cape have several capital intensive development proposals being circulated. These include offshore oil and gas, green hydrogen, a deep water port in Bukluvai, uh, which is about 60 Ks north of Port Nalith and more diamond mining prospecting. Uh, meanwhile, as you know, we've mentioned, the fishers are being systematically excluded from marine spatial planning. They've also have been restricted from accessing rock lobster fishing grounds just north of Port Nolith due to a diamond mining state-owned enterprise. I attended this green hydrogen consultation meeting, and while that's you know predominantly a, a land-based activity, they they do require desalination, um, which they're going to gather ocean water for that and the brine, um, which is the byproduct, will definitely affect the marine environment. Uh, so that is something that has been more recent that the fishers are now just now aware of. But in this consultation meeting, they said something quite profound, which I think really sums up these developments quite nicely. They called the Green Hydrogen Project in the Northern Cape an investment destination. And they said that the investment is not for you, it is for your children or two to three generations further out. If we do not have an investment now, where will our children have a school and eat? 
we're not doing this project for the Northern Cape, we're doing it for the globe and for the country. So they do consult with the local communities, but they just tell them how it is. Uh, they don't engage them and the local community doesn't have any kind of legal recourse or to have their voice heard or their views taken into account? Um, I, I think we can definitely delve into that um, just after I wrap up this question, because we have had several court cases around uh, the lack of meaningful consultation. So I think that's a really important aspect to bring in. So I'd say there's more consultation efforts now because of these two court cases uh, that the small scale fishers were involved in, but it's still quite a top down process, right? It is still going to a community with this agenda. And I think that's kind of the fundamental flaw with development. It is coming to the community already with a plan and not necessarily listening to them about what their wants and needs are and what the community is really struggling with and how certain developments can maybe alleviate those issues. But the quote from the Green Hydrogen Consultation really speaks to the fact that these developments are inherently tied to the demands of the global north and are being developed for the globalized economy, right? It's not uh, these local communities that are in mind. But the question remains, what is in it for the people at the local level who are sitting on these natural resources, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's diamonds or the land that has these ideal conditions for creating wind and solar energy to turn into green hydrogen? So I think it's important to note that it's not the resources themselves that are threatening the survival of the fishers. It's what is being done with them? How are we choosing to utilize them? Who is being faced with the environmental impacts and those consequences? And then who is ultimately economically benefiting from them? Well, Menka mentioned about infrastructure development, but we've had other projects, and I know you have written about them as well, that is about marine protected areas, which are actually meant for conservation, also affecting the livelihoods of small fishers. Yeah, so while marine protected areas are viewed as an important tool to protect biodiversity, habitats, and to rebuild fishery stocks, these have often been declared in areas where small-scale fishers have traditionally fished or are still fishing. And of course, this has had huge impacts on food, livelihoods, access to important cultural sites, and so on. And um, we have several examples in South Africa where small-scale fishing communities have actually been forcibly removed to make way for marine protected areas. So on the one hand, whilst we're concerned about the increasing pressure, uh, in particular from many of these extractive industries that Menkes talked about, and we're obviously concerned about the destruction of our coasts and our oceans, you know, marine protected areas should not be seen as the panacea because really small-scale fishes are not the main cause of biodiversity loss of fisheries collapses or declines. While I agree that uh, marine protected areas are an important tool to protect biodiversity, habitats and build and rebuild and protect fishery stocks, they have often been declared in areas where small-scale fishers fish and have traditionally fished and of course, this will result in huge impacts on their access to food resources and on their livelihoods. And in South Africa, we have several marine protected areas, and mostly these are no-take marine protected areas. And of course, small-scale fishers have, in some of these areas, been forcibly removed to make way for MPAs. So there's a very long legacy of MPAs having a very detrimental impact on small-scale fishers and on local fishing communities. For our audience, when Mo says MPAs, she means marine protected areas. You know, we need to recognize that small-scale fishers are not the main cause of biodiversity loss, fisheries, fish collapses, and so on. You know, there are many other extractive industries, the industrial sector, and of course, climate change that are contributing to the state of our oceans. And what's critical then, if we are going to start looking at declaring areas for protection, is that small-scale fishers are integrally involved in any planning and uh, decision-making process with respect to the declaration of uh, protected areas. So, Merle, you mentioned uh, climate change there towards the end. How is that affecting these communities and their socioeconomic situation? 
Yes, so of course, small-scale fishers are already living in dire socioeconomic circumstances, and they're just not getting the support from government. And in fact, many small-scale fishers' socioeconomic circumstances are worse off than they were, say, 30 years ago, you know, in terms of adequate services in some communities, for example, where Menka's working, you know, access to clinics or hospitals in close proximity to where people live is, is just not available. And so now we have climate change and all the associated impacts um, associated with climate change. This is just another stressor on already very marginalized coastal communities. So things like increased storm events, flooding, coastal erosion, and the changing environmental conditions in the sea that affect the distribution of fish. I mean, these are all adding to those very stressed living conditions. And I think the uncertainty associated with climate change is one of the very difficult things that small-scale fishing communities are having to deal with because it's very difficult for them to plan. Can I jump in and add to this? So climate change as a theme has certainly cropped up in my research as well. I mean, the fishers know the ocean like the back of their hand. They can pick up on how it's changed over the years with global warming and overfishing uh, from trawlers and the industrial sector. For example, the fishers and I also work with diamond divers, they have both strongly lamented about bad weather days. They say that they are lucky if they get 10 good weather days per month, whereas maybe a decade or so ago, they could actually go out to sea for these two week long stretches. Another fisher told me that he has noticed that the whales that he sees when he goes out to sea are actually getting more agitated, whereas before they were completely unbothered by the fishers and their boats, and they cater this behavior to climate change. So the fishers in Port Nolith actually had a really terrible snook season last year. So snook is a type of fish that they are highly dependent on um, in terms of food and nutritional security and their economic livelihood. And it also has a cultural significance to them as well. But this horrible snook season, um, which they also cater to climate change and in the industrial sector, it absolutely makes them even more marginalized and vulnerable. They are perpetually faced with the task of getting enough food on the table. And it just seems to be getting worse year after year due to these climate change impacts and coupling that with being systematically excluded from marine spatial planning and total allowable effort and catch processes. I'm going to reflect a little bit on what we have learned so far. I know we're going to get into the details of your dissertation, Menka, but even what we've heard so far makes me understand the literature of climate change that we read come to life, really, in the words that you've said. These communities are vulnerable. They do not have access to health, education, and they are affected by climate change in a way nobody else is. The words that we use in climate change language, you know, lack of adaptive capacity, really come across in, in the work that you have done sitting and working and talking to these communities, Menka, it is very, very obvious. At the same time, you know, what is absolutely very, very critical that I think the audience should take away is the contradiction between the transition to the low carbon economy and the local food security in these regions. The transition to the low carbon economy involves the global energy transition, green hydrogen, offshore wind, and of course, countries like South Africa would like to take out as much oil as possible from offshore oil and gas installations to increase their economic, the country's economic benefits, even as the world weans itself off on oil. But at the same time, the offshore wind energy installation, the green hydrogen installations are going to affect the local communities. And so will conservation efforts the marine protected areas that the Merle is talking about. This contradiction is, I think, at the heart of the problem of the way we approach climate change and the practical considerations that we take at the community level. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a contradiction. That's what I've noticed very much in my research. South Africa has a just energy transition plan, most of it which is green hydrogen, but then when I attend a consultation for drilling 
offshore oil and gas, you know, all these blocks up and down the west coast of South Africa, they also claim that offshore oil and gas is needed to make that transition to renewables because South Africa is actually highly dependent on coal. I think it's approximately like 80% of our energy and electricity sources come from coal. It's, it's quite high. Um, so when I go to these consultation meetings on offshore oil and gas, um, a lot of the arguments as to why we need it is because it is slightly less, or it's, I guess, slightly more cleaner than coal, um, and that South Africa just really needs to, um, you know, change the way that our electricity um, is being produced and consumed because we are deeply affected by load shedding, which are these rolling blackouts. There are still so many communities around South Africa that don't have electricity access. But I think we really need to interrogate, you know, is offshore oil and gas the answer requires a massive amount of infrastructure. Menka, I'm glad that you are bringing out the contradiction. How have the communities responded to this potential loss of livelihood? Sure. So, yeah, we had two critical court cases a couple of years ago, which small scale fishers took uh, two corporations to court. One was Shell, which was along the wild coast of South Africa for a seismic survey, and the other was against Searcher along the west coast of South Africa. Sadly, small-scale fishers in South Africa have to lean particularly heavy on litigation as a means to uphold their rights. They have been granted these rights legally, and it's always a tremendous amount of effort to remind the government and the private sector of their rights, which inevitably takes place through the court. So these two recent court cases against Shell and Searcher were due to the lack of meaningful consultation for seismic surveys along these two coasts. And the fishers argued that the seismic survey was a direct impact to these coastal communities and their right to food. The data wasn't accurate on where the snook runs, where they even go out to sea to fish. And ultimately, there was no effort to speak to them about these seismic surveys. And also to clarify, seismic surveys are kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, for offshore oil and gas. It's really uh, just a mechanism to find hydrocarbon deposits um, underneath in the ocean. And so while the fishers won both the court cases, uh, we're now faced with the issue of what do we actually want out of meaningful consultation? And it's very important to distinguish that meaningful consultation is not consent. So just because someone is consulted on a development does not automatically mean that they consent to such an activity happening. But now that these companies and the government, they're making more of an effort to go directly to fishers and coastal communities. But as I've mentioned before, it's still quite a top-down process. You know, they, they go and they explain what the seismic survey is, what it does, and then we can add public comment. But uh, like I said, like litigation can only do so much. It doesn't give fishers the livelihood that they rightly deserve, but it does help them uphold their right to a livelihood that is dependent on marine resources, which is more often than not violated. Well, could you say a little bit about what you think this kind of litigation can achieve in the long term? And potentially, could it also work against the long term interests of these communities? Well, I do think there is a place for litigation as a strategy to challenge unfair decisions or potential projects that might impact on the environment. But of course, litigation really is, is not a solution to the kinds of impacts and challenges that small-scale fishers face. I mean, there are some important aspects of the outcomes of these court cases. Of course, you know, they might set a precedent in terms of, in the case of Search and Shell, how public participation should be and must be done. It sets a precedent around forcing consultants who are working for, say, big oil and mine companies to ensure that issues of cultural heritage, various other perhaps investigations that they might not have done are now done because the recognition now is we really need to look more closely at things like social and cultural impacts. But, you know, the problem with this is that we're focusing on a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, small-scale fisher communities and their NGO and academic partners cannot be 
responding to and fighting against every oil and gas mining or aquaculture development that is deemed to be unsustainable or that affects the rights of coastal communities. And so whilst I think there's a place for litigation, it's more about looking at our policies and looking at do we need to amend our policies and, and where we do have policies in place which are appropriate and we have some we have many good environmental and small scale fishing policies in South Africa that are considered to be very progressive we've got this issue of the mismatch between the policy rhetoric and how action unfolds on the ground and the interpretation of some of these provisions and i think you know one of the biggest problems we're facing in south africa which is struggling economically at the time is that economic projects and the benefits that government sees that accrue from such projects are definitely outweighing environmental and, and social considerations. But of course, communities, although they do welcome some projects and investments that can grow their economy, they are not prepared to accept those projects at the expense of destroying and damaging the environment and affecting their livelihoods and their cultural rights. Exactly my point, Professor Merrill. Is there a new future that we can at all envisage? I mean, the IPCC chapter on climate change and adaptation devote 10 pages, perhaps, on small-scale fishers. The FAO has published a full report on it. What sort of policies, or more particularly, as you say, how should governments implement policies that protect the livelihoods of small-scale fishers in the context of economic development and climate change? Well, that's a very big question. And of course, it's the it's the heart of the issue, this balancing kind of socioeconomic development needs against environmental and social justice issues. And in fact, our constitution you know, is very clear about the environmental right and the protection of human rights, but it also has, has a very clear statement that we need to balance these two. And of course, we believe the government's not getting the balance right. I mean, we do have things like the voluntary guidelines for securing small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty alleviation. We do have guideline doc guidance coming from the IPCC. And in fact, our government has embraced these kinds of provisions, which really are there to ensure that small-scale fishers, coastal communities are protected against these kind of extractive activities, um, against the potential impacts of climate change. And I think I get back to this point about this breakdown between government rhetoric and their embrace of these international soft law instruments, these guidelines, but the way in which these provisions are interpreted. And I guess that's one of the reasons why communities and their NGO partners are often ending up in court, because they're basically challenging the way in which these provisions are being interpreted. So... How can government implement policies in a better way that serves the interests of both the economy and communities, you know, remains the big question. And I guess civil society, small scale fishing communities, academics, NGOs are really working collaboratively in South Africa to try and hold government to account. You've been looking at this for many, many years. Is there any one example that you think in South Africa or outside, that you'd say, yes, let's do it this way, what I would call a successful policy implementation? I guess my mind immediately goes to places like Madagascar and parts of the east coast of Africa, where, where we have the introduction of things called locally managed marine areas, LMMAs, where local communities are basically being given much more power to take responsibility and make decisions about their own coastal areas. So their traditional rights to harvest resources, their cultural rights and cultural connections to the oceans are being recognized and respected. And they are basically acting as stewards of these coastal areas. And there we're seeing things like recovery of marine resources. We're seeing local communities playing a much more active role in decision making, in management, in putting in place rules to access and harvest these resources. 
So I guess this idea of devolution of power to the local level, to communities who, as Menke has said, have a much better understanding and knowledge of their environment is really a very important mechanism, I think, for improving this balance. So really increasing the powers of local communities as rights holders and custodians of their own resources. But unfortunately, the power of economic growth and, and the government's desire to kind of grow the economy at all costs in South Africa is really mitigating against that devolution of power and that respect of those uh, traditional rights. So we've talked a lot about the role of policy and the government. What is the role that corporations can play? What's the positive role that they can play in this process? And I'd like to ask both of you that, but maybe I'll start with Menka. Sure. So what I have noticed in my work and attending all these different consultation efforts by the private sector is there is definitely this fundamentally different goals and needs between corporations and communities who are affected by mining and, and extraction. So they're required to do social impact, but it's not necessarily in the interests of corporations, even though they might say it is, but is it actually enforced? And what are the community's expectations of getting a return from a corporation? For example, many oil and gas companies will promise a new school or a garden. And I have actually heard one oil and gas corporation that they would say that they would go to a community and address menstrual health and hygiene. So should they be the ones talking about such subjects? And again, it's this quite top-down approach. I think what is fundamentally wrong with development is this top-down process in communities who are sitting on this vast mineral wealth and they're not the economic beneficiaries. So maybe instead of the, the corporation going to communities and saying, hey, we're going to educate you on menstrual health and hygiene or give you a school, you know, maybe listen to them first and really start with what their needs are and work from the bottom up. But again, it's not necessarily the interests of a corporation whose priority is maybe profit, but we can and we need to interrogate how or if we can actually live in this globalized capitalist society, which these corporations are really thriving on. Um, and which is the ultimately kind of the barrier between communities benefiting from natural resource extraction and how corporations and the government actually treat these communities. I don't really have an answer, to be quite honest, but I think it really needs to start from the communities themselves and work up. I think this top-down process just hasn't worked for them and something needs to shift. Well, I'd be very interested in your views, and particularly if you know of examples of good practice, again, from corporations. Yeah, so I think Menkes captured some of the key issues there. But the biggest issue is that, you know, corporations, investors, they are coming into local communities, promising jobs, skills development, local economic development, which, of course, is attractive to poor coastal communities. Yet when it comes to the actual implementation of these projects, the benefits that flow to these communities, as Menke has really said, is very limited by comparison to the profits that are being made by these companies. I mean, Menke and I were just at a talk the other night where we heard about the billions being made by companies involved with heavy mineral sand mining on the west coast of South Africa. Yet the communities living in these very areas are still living in poverty, high rates of employment, and, you know, there's a sense of hopelessness amongst many coastal communities in the midst of this wealth that's being generated. So what should corporations do? Well, of course, they need to consult. But consultation has to go beyond just having public meetings and giving the communities an opportunity to air their concerns. But these views, these values, this knowledge that is held by coastal communities must be integrated into planning and decision making. And the problem is that that sometimes means that that project should not go ahead, which means government has to be listening to communities as well. It's not just the corporations, but government needs to get a better understanding of what the interests, the needs, the priorities, the values of local communities are. 
And then, of course, the whole question of benefit sharing and benefits flowing back into communities. At the moment, this is a whole area that is being largely overlooked by government. Companies are required in the mining sector, for example, to develop what are called social labor plans, but there isn't proper monitoring of the extent to which these monies promised are actually flowing to local communities, where this money is ending up, how it's being distributed, to whom. And I think there needs to be a lot more monitoring and accountability with respect to how these benefits and profits are being shared locally. You know, Menka mentioned that probably has to start with the communities, but who will work with the communities? Who will empower the communities? That's always the question, right? And in my work in Africa, I have obviously seen local NGOs you know, often struggle for funding. And international NGOs, they are well-funded, but they're often moving from one project to another. They are sometimes looked at in suspicion by the local government as well. Where is the way forward and how should local communities be supported? I'm happy to start with this uh, response. Community yeah. organizations and non-governmental organizations are playing a very important role in a variety of ways in coastal communities in terms of raising awareness to the rest of society about the plight of communities and the threats to them, but also in raising their awareness about their rights in terms of the law and also in building capacity of fisher organizations to challenge unfair decisions. And we have many non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations in South Africa that have long-standing relationships with coastal communities in this country. And so they're also supporting small-scale fisheries, fishers in, in claiming their rights to their lands and to their waters, to their fisheries resources. They're also providing legal and technical advice. They're also facilitating their involvement in meetings and workshops, not only in South Africa, but even in linking up with fisher folk from communities in other countries. Now, some of these NGOs, as I've said, are longstanding. They've been reasonably well resourced over the years. But of course, there are increasing challenges in securing funding. And I guess one of the reasons for that is in South Africa, there are, are more and more issues that are coming to the fore, new and emerging NGOs and civil society organizations dealing with the myriad of issues facing our country. And so I think the importance of building kind of alliances and partnerships of social partners in support of communities becomes increasingly important. And, and that's where I think the role of researchers and academics comes in to work with civil society organizations, NGOs, to begin to support and tackle some of, of these biggest challenges. I think the other thing is, although there are many times where we're having to challenge government, we also need to bring government on board, and they too need to have their capacity developed in terms of having a better understanding of the needs, the priorities, and the rights of these coastal communities. Minka, you might want to add to that. Yeah, so the importance of these NGOs is really critical for uh, supporting the small-scale fisheries sector. Merle and I often work quite closely with many of them. Um, and I think one thing that has really stuck out to me since I came to South Africa um, almost three years ago is just the amount of time it takes uh, for these people that are being affected by all these developments the time that it takes to actually be going to these consultation meetings, right? Because as Merle alluded to previously, is that each of these individual blocks of offshore oil and gas or whatever um, extractive development is taking place, they are required to do consultation um, and they do this piece by piece. So one block will have one separate um, environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment and consultation. And it adds up, it gets exhausting for the fishers in these coastal communities and their livelihoods at sea, they should, they should be at sea, they should be fishing. And I think that's where the NGOs and people like myself and Merle can really step up and help support them 
and go to these consultations and just kind of tell the fishers and be in communication with what's going on because they don't have necessarily the time or the capacity, right? They're not getting paid to go to consultations. They they really need to focus on getting food on the table. Their livelihoods are at sea. They're not in a meeting room necessarily. So while I think consultation is very important and for these fishers to be aware and for companies to be making the effort it is still such a lengthy process. And I think these developments need, need to be looked at cumulatively and holistically instead of kind of this block by block scenario, because it's just very time consuming for everyone um, to be attending all these very various consultation meetings. And that's where I see the NGOs really stepping up in regards to that, in regards to the court cases, they've been heavily involved. So yeah, as Merle discussed, they have a really important role in South Africa and we're seeing more and more of them crop up. And it is because of these plethora of issues and development activities that that are just having this massive influx within South Africa. Um, so yeah, they, they play this really critical role. And I'm excited to also see the different types of work that they come out with in the future as well. I think you know, they play an important role. But what I still struggle with is the type of funding that they will get. As Merle said, that there is a plethora of issues. So there'll be enough funding for these local NGOs to be able to do all the work that they need to do. That's the question that is still bothering me. Well, as I mentioned, I think funding is is getting more difficult. I mean, certainly at the start of democracy in South Africa in 1994, there was a definite reduction in funding because I think many funders saw this new democratic government as going to pick up all the challenges that many NGOs were working on. But but in fact, as the government has proceeded and developed policies and implemented policies, once again, there's been such a need for NGOs and civil society organizations to hold them accountable and sometimes, as, as mentioned, to challenge some of their decisions and their plans. I mean, what's surprising is that many of these uh, NGOs are still going, you know, and they're still going strong. So that suggests to me that they are managing to find funding. I'm also not familiar enough with the NGO funding arena to to make uh, predictions into the future. But what I will say is that we have many thriving NGOs and community-based organizations in South Africa. We've come to the end of the podcast. Menka and Merle. What questions do you have for us? Yeah, well, thanks. I think the only question I have really is who is the audience for the podcast? One of the things I often find is that, you know, one engages in panel discussions, you write articles, and very often this material is distributed, but it often reaches those people who share your views and who who have similar concerns and, and possibly engaged in similar kind of work. So share your views and values. And I'm just wondering who you're targeting with these podcasts. In a moment, I work in the world of climate. My world is often people who get the climate issues, but I'm not sure they get the contradiction issues. They understand it. You know, the challenges, you know, the contradictions between local food security and and setting up a green hydrogen. But I don't think they get it so easily. So to that extent, I'm hoping my audience, the people, the people I work with, the renewable energy project people, the local financial institutions, they understand the deep contradiction a little better. Speaking for myself, uh, you know, as you know, I teach in a business school and I research particularly large corporations. I'm particularly interested in how corporations try to both achieve their financial performance, but also their increasingly stated objectives in terms of having positive social and environmental impact. I've studied a number of large companies. I'm aware of the challenges they face, but my audience is those companies and to try to enable them to be able to achieve those very difficult and conflicting objectives. So that's my primary audience. We also, in our business school, teach executives or senior leaders from government and from the third sector. So that would be my secondary audience, people in those sectors that are interested in these big questions of how one delivers prosperity, particularly those in developing countries, but does it in an environmentally and social sustainable way. Thank you for that. And and if people want to get in touch with you, how should they? 
Uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is mk and then my last name Van Sant, V A N S A N T, at gmail.com. Yes, my email is Merle Sermon. So it's Merle, M E R L E dot Sermon, S O W M A N, at UCT dot A C dot C D. Lovely. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. This has been obviously a fascinating conversation. If you like this podcast, do visit us on regainparadise.org, regainparadise.com. Uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and you can also subscribe to these podcasts on Anchor, Spotify, Google, Apple, and YouTube.